The West Australian honeybee industry is still reeling from the tragic death of one of its stalwarts in a road crash late last year. Stephen Davies was a third generation beekeeper and a major driver in a remarkable transformation of an industry rapidly becoming a global player in the Medi honey market. The state's unique Jarrah and other forests are producing honey with even stronger antimicrobial properties than New Zealand's Manuka honey, which is a billion dollar business across the Tasman. Sean Murphy has this special report on the West's liquid gold rush. It's Western Australia's famous tourism destination, but Rottnest Island has another lesser known claim to fame. It's also home to what's probably the longest continuous queen bee breeding program anywhere in the world. Every year about 300 hives are shipped to Rottnest where nature takes its course hidden from view in the centre of the island. It's basically just a line breeding program. Colin Flay is one of eight commercial beekeepers who pool their resources to run what's known as the Better Bee Program. Why Rotnest? Uh, because it's far enough off the mainland. See, Rotnest is 16k off the mainland, a drone will fly eight and a queen will fly five, so that gives you 13k, so you've got a 3k buffer. So really the only drones that these queens can make with are the ones that we bring into the island. So that's the idea, everyone breeds from their best uh, queens, breeds drones, bring them over here, they're um, a bit slower to mature so they have to come over early and then they fly, they mature and then we bring the queens over to synchronise the uh, sexual maturation rates and then they mate like most things do on Rotto I guess and then uh, yeah we'll find out on Tuesday how and we went. Back on the mainland the queens are sorted to sustain an industry which has been closed to the rest of Australia for 40 years. The breeding program was started by the Department of Agriculture in 1980 because quarantine restrictions meant queens could no longer be sourced from the eastern states. There's a disease outbreak in South Australia called European fowl brood and the Department of Agriculture at the time didn't want to uh, get that disease into western Australia. The department got stock donated from the industry and we established 20 breeding lines from the best stock that they donated. And once that was established, we used artificial insemination and homogenised semen to select the best queens in the program. Lee Allen started the program and now in retirement is still a keen participant. Well, as long as I can stand and, and keep going, I'll be, I'll be right here. Well, you can just go to the top of the class, Miss Bates. After nearly 40 years of continuous genetic improvement, the program's queens are renowned for their calm temperament and ability to breed bees, producing nearly double the global average of honey per hive. When we have brood capped, that means that the queen is the correct age and she's the right lineage. And so we can clip her wing not too high, otherwise she bleeds and let me just concentrate while I do this and then we mark her as well just it's easy to find the queen in a big box if she's marked. Tiffany Bates has been breeding queens for the last six years for the University of WA. The best are worth up to twelve hundred dollars each but most of the Rottnest queens are kept by the beekeepers in the program. Mark her up. Well she's the breeder really so some people think that she's running things that seems to not be the case she can lay 2,000 eggs a day she also pumps pheromones out from all different parts of her body her feet her abdomen and the bees check on those pheromones all the time to make sure she's functioning properly and if she's not they'll supersede her they'll make a new one so it's a pretty ruthless situation um, but her job basically is just laying eggs and making sure that she's keeping the colony running in terms of pheromone production. So healthy queen, healthy hive? Absolutely. Yep. Young queen also makes a really big difference. If the queen's getting a bit old, um, the colony will start to be less productive and less <laughs> disease resistant. And then you just put it back. She'll smell a bit like my fingers. The bees question her when she goes in, but then she's okay.
It's not just the breeding program in WA that stands the industry apart here. Bioactive honey from the state's unique Jarrah and other forests has been discovered by the world, sparking a liquid gold rush. Oh yeah, they're all coming in now, mate. As soon as people realise the worth of the product, because, you know, it sells itself. If you've got a good product that has major health benefits, well, then people are going to want it. And if there's a market that's quite, you know, got a, quite a premium on it due to the, you know, compared to the normal price, aren't it? But it certainly is a big boost for uh, people that have been bumping along the bottom for quite some time. Stephen Davies is the second largest honey producer in WA. He's just spent two and a half million dollars building a new production plant south of Perth. It's one of five new facilities built in the west to cater for surging demand, particularly from Asia. Prices for honey sourced from Jarrah, Mary and Kerry forests in the southwest are spiralling upwards. No question. That's what's driving it. It's like any agricultural industry. As soon as the prices go up, everybody wants a, a piece of it. And, and that's what's happening in our industry as well, for sure. Um, prices going from sort of 2 and $3 a kilo, which we were getting 10 years ago, were literally below the cost of production. Uh, now we're seeing some honeys, and not all of them by any means, but some honeys up around 20 and $30 a kilo at the farm gate. Prices are based on bioactivity the level of medical and health giving properties in the honey and the strongest have earned as much as a hundred dollars a kilogram in China. Independent testing of Jarrah and Mary honey in New Zealand last year found it had stronger antimicrobial properties than Manuka honey. Rather than talking about one is better than another, what we would like to see in a therapeutic manner is that in different situations you will use a different honey. Diversity is a very good thing uh, because uh, microbial resistance is something that uh, naturally occurs over time. And so when we have a diversity of mechanisms of, of, of uh, dealing with microbial resistance, what we end up is stronger, th stronger therapeutic outcomes. Yeah, we've got a good range of honeys this year. I'm noticing that there's quite a bit of variation in colour here. Ken Dodds is running a $3 million research program at WA's Chem Centre Analytical Laboratory helping build science-backed foundations for WA's emerging active honey industry. So far, tests have shown the WA product also has strong anti-inflammatory properties and is prebiotic, helping improve human gut health. Key to the research will be creating a certification system for the varied range of bioactivity in the forest honeys. Really what I'm doing is helping them produce something uh, more consistently and more clearly identifying for them the key attributes of those honey that they can then use in their marketing. And then the chemistry centre, of course, is providing the international certification that gives the credibility that enables them to get a really good price for the, their product. The Chem Centre project is part of a huge new focus on research and WA is now also home to a national collaborative research centre for honey bee products. It'll be based in this brand new $10 million facility north of Perth. And this is our laboratory here. Liz Barber is the new CRC's Chief Executive Officer. When we have full capacity, we're going to have What's it, 26 projects actually running in the CRC? 16 of those are actually going to be run by PhD students. So it's just, it's going to be a huge cohort of people just all suddenly focusing, you know, on, all on honey at the same time. The research will target areas such as bee health and nutrition, beekeeper training, traceability, and chain of custody fraud protection. What it does is that it actually connects us with everything that's happening internationally. And that's the most important thing, is keeping an eye on that we can actually translate immediately of something we see out there that we can actually bring to Australia and actually incorporate it in what we're doing. So that's what, what's so great about being a cooperative research centre, is you're very hands-on. You know, it's not you do the research and you're isolated in a laboratory. 
Um, we are very much involved with the industry. I mean, we've got more industry partners than we have researchers. Australia's biggest honey producer, Capilano, bought into the WA market in 2013 and is now the state's biggest producer. It says the new research will help change what has historically been a cottage industry, producing mostly blended honeys. The company says new industry standards can help protect consumers from the sort of market fraud which has plagued New Zealand's Manuka exports. It's believed two to three times more Manuka is sold globally than is actually produced across the Tasman. With Western Australian Jarrah, for instance, we want to make sure there's a honey standard for that Jarrah, right from the word, you know, from the, from the forage area in, in the bush right through to the actual end product being sold in the, in the retail outlet overseas or whatever. So they can trace it back right through to the actual uh, area where the, where the honey came from. Uh, and it's so important that we, we maintain a presence in Western Australia, we keep packing in Western Australia, we don't want to send bulk honey overseas, which can be adulterated, like New Zealand stuff has happened. Um, it, it can end up being, you can just send you know, 10 tonne over, it can end up being 100 tonne because they put something else in it. So we want to make sure we can, that whole custodian supply chain is, is, is maintained. And the CRC will look at that as well, that's part of their brief, is to really focus on how we can um, maintain that full traceability through the network. Uh, Bay 28, thanks Bobby. Cheers mate. The industry wants to develop a certified network of buyers overseas to control the supply chain and prevent cheating. But for now, the priority is trying to increase supply. Jarrah and other forest honeys only make up 10% of Capilano's production. We want to triple this industry in Western Australia. We, in terms of supply, South Australia is 19% of national, WA is only 7% of national, so we really are under, under producing Western Australia. Hobby hives are popping up all over Perth. Even Parliament House has some. While supply has remained reasonably static, beekeeper numbers have grown dramatically in WA on the back of a hobby sector bonanza. Membership of the WA Apiarists Association grew from 350 to 1,200 in 12 months. John Farhati parlayed his hobby into a thriving business with more than a hundred hives, mostly in suburban gardens. His postcode honey is a partnership with householders and landowners. The arrangement is that um, I return a share of the honey to, to them and um, yeah, that's all most people are, are interested in, either just uh, honey for their, for their own use, uh, friends and family, or um, yeah, some people just do it for environmental reasons, for uh, improve pollination in their gardens. The reality for most amateur beekeepers is that it's a huge leap from tending a few hives at home to running a commercial business. Simon Green took that step six years ago and while he is tapping into the lucrative forest honey market, it's not easy. Oh, I wish it was, you know, all you need to do is drive down the road, find a patch of bush and put your beehives there and all of a sudden you're picking up, you know, two, three kilos of liquid gold per day per hive. The reality is not that. The reality is you need to find places to put your bees, you know, you've got to... Your site selection is paramount. To find those sites and keep his bees healthy and productive, Simon Green has to truck his 350 hives hundreds of kilometres in search of flowering trees and bushes. He's part of a new research project using satellite technology to keep track of how much honey his bees are producing. When I wake up in the morning, I can turn on my phone, I can see how heavy that hive is. At lunchtime, I know how many bees have left the hive. By dinner time, I know how many bees have come back and how much honey they've put on for the day. If we get to a downturn in yield, then we know we need to find a new site to move those hives. So just the saving of one day honey production per site can mean the difference of, you know, tons a year to cap, us. Camera cap off. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Finding productive sites at the right time yeah, is a yeah. challenge because Jarrah trees only flower every second year. Now the Chem Centre has also combined with Curtin University's Remote Sensing and Satellite Research Group 
to track when and where the forests are flowering. Drones are being used to calibrate the data, potentially saving beekeepers huge amounts of time and money. And, uh, yeah, a couple of nice trees over there, good, good height, good flower mm. buds. The drone project is, is very important because uh, one of the things that beekeepers run into is the amount of distance that they have to cover to service hives. And so if they can get uh, important information that says this zone over here is ready to have a, have a, uh, a hive put on it and, and a hive can be put there at that optimal time, then we get much more efficient use of the hives. Three quarters of the state's 4,000 tonnes of honey is produced on Crown land and the government has been opening up hundreds of new sites to provide more access for commercial beekeepers. The industry has welcomed this but believes the forests need greater protection. Every year tens of thousands of hectares are deliberately burned to reduce the fuel load and prevent uncontrollable fires. The reality is, is they're doing millions of dollars of damage to our industry every day. Wouldn't it be worse though if there was a major uncontrollable bushfire? Well, that's a debatable point. I, I don't disagree with prescribed burning by any means, but the way they're doing it at the moment, just massive big tracts of land are, are not and, and burning pretty, pretty much at the wrong time of the year is, is you know, having a much lasting impact than uh, what we'd like to see. Yeah, I think they've got a target for about 200,000 hectare a year and the idea is they burn it on a six year rotation. I think that's the, that's the theory they've got now, but we're sort of challenging that there might be the, some better science, you know, that might indicate that those burning frequencies may be too frequent, you know. WA's old growth forests have yielded some of the world's finest hardwood timber. They've been protected since 2001, but more than a third of the state's forests are still available for logging. There's some big jarra trees that have been pushed over to make the road. And... According to WA's Forest Alliance, new areas of jarra forest, such as the Barabup Coop near Nanup, are being cleared for loggers. So you can see here they've cleared maybe two, three hectares um, and as it's turned out parts of the work that they've done here pushing all of this forest over was actually old growth. How typical is this? How vulnerable are the Jarra forests? Well about 7,000 hectares was logged last year uh, just in the Jarra forests and about a further thousand hectares was cleared for bauxite mining. Um, the issue with the Jarra is that the regrowth is very unsuccessful. Uh, so what we're seeing both from an ecological perspective and from a timber production point of view, the regrowth jarrah just isn't providing the kind of returns that, that uh, was expected by the timber industry. So once these areas are logged, they really are gone um, in terms of their ecological function and, and in terms of future timber production. The Alliance commissioned research by the left-leaning think tank, the Australia Institute, which found the state's Forest Products Commission had been losing money since it was established 16 years ago. The research is supported by Augusta Margaret River Shire Councillor Peter Lane, a former resource industry geologist who has studied the Commission's accounts extensively. He says most of the timber cut is sold for low value firewood and fuel. Over the last five years they've logged about 2.6 million tonnes of logs and recorded a loss of $46 million. Well, the Forest Products Commission has never accepted that analysis. Um, and obviously it's something that, you know, we need to keep uh, an eye on. Alana McTiernan is WA's Minister for Agriculture and Regional Development. She says the Forest Products Commission is confident beekeeping and logging can coexist, but ultimately it'll come down to economics. We're very conscious we do need to keep jobs in regional areas, but we're you know, we're not approaching this ideologically. We will see what is going to give us the best return and generate the most jobs. She says the government is excited by the honeybee industry's potential, with manuka plantations now in development and more research going into the state's unique flora. We've got the whole rest of this state. We've got, you know, the, the horticultural areas, but we've got 
all of these other areas of uh, native plants where you would think the same biological processes that were at play in producing such fantastic antimicrobials as we see here in Jarra could in fact be a play. So there's a hell of a lot of more research that we want to do and we want to work with Indigenous communities. We've got Indigenous communities have indicated that they're interested in seeing how uh, we might unleash some of this potential um, in other parts of the state. The biggest risk to the industry is biosecurity and the state is relying on border controls and nearly 50 sentinel hives like this one near Fremantle. They're the first line of defence against introduced pests such as the varroa mite, which has devastated honeybee populations all over the world. Even with the best biosecurity measures, Australia is extremely vulnerable to the varroa mite. In fact, one international expert says it's a matter of when, not if, there's an incursion here. You know, it's got to every other country in the world. Um, we live in a global community. Um, huge amounts of um, commodities are shipped around the world. And so it's just a matter of, you know, it will arrive at some point. Professor Stephen Martin is an international expert on bees and was the keynote speaker at the Queensland Industries Conference last year. He said varroa mite was a huge threat to Australia's bee populations, but it could be managed. It's killed millions of colonies. Um, everywhere it goes, there is a change in beekeeping, a change in attitude. You now have to start controlling uh, the mites. That involves putting pesticides into the colonies. Um, countries that didn't um, decide to treat I think Czechoslovakia was one example, and uh, it lost you know, over a million colonies. Uh, almost all the colonies disappeared. Um, the other huge impact of the varroa mite is you lose all your feral colonies. Um, so it, it changes things, and you rely more heavily on the beekeepers to keep the bees going. Professor Martin said international research was now centred on varroa-resistant bees in Brazil and Africa to try to understand the genetics and breed immunity into bee colonies. The new honey bee product CRC says it's keen to join the international research effort using cutting edge proteomics. What you do is you actually see the protein profile of a bee that actually is resistant. And instead of us actually you know, exposing the bee to the disease, what we do is we look for those protein profiles and then we start breeding those bees up. And of course the big advantage is of course we've got one of the oldest breeding programs, you know, here in Western Australia. Rottnest Island's Better Bee Program has been central to maintaining a healthy, chemical-free industry in WA. Now it could also play a leading role in finding solutions to the biggest threat to bee populations around the world. You are you getting into it now? Yeah, that'll be an essential part of the breeding queens. Because of its isolation on Rottnest Island, you could go and set up a permanent breeding program over there and supply the rest of the um, rest of the mainland with, you know, and you could trial varroa, uh, you know, resistant stock and things like that. So yeah, the Rottnest Island project is sort of a, an integral part of the whole survival sort of mechanism we've got in plan, yeah.